Welcome back to This Week. Time now to get the views of our media and political experts, Metro Councilman at Large Jerry Maynard, and her daily on 1510 WLAC syndicated talk show host, Steve Gill. Welcome, Thank gentlemen. You. Nice Thank to you. see you again. As we tape this on Friday, Congress is in session, but getting ready to go on a week long recess. And as they do, we're at another spending bill, an interim spending bill. To get, to get the government operating through November 18th, I believe it is. The House passed it. The Senate has, has uh, killed it for the time being. So here, here we are at another impasse. And I guess the question is, are they going to go home and leave the government hanging again? Is something going to be resolved in the last minute? You know, usually you see something get resolved, but I'd have to say, man, when I was in school, and I know the same thing was true with Jerry, I loved recess, <laughs> but nobody loves recess more than this president, this Congress, and this Senate. It seems like they're the most recessed they people I've ever seen. Maybe if they'd stay and get a little work done, they could get America back to work, too. You heard Republicans say they don't like the uncertainty and that the markets are not doing well because of the uncertainty. What's happening is you can lay that at the feet of President Obama. Now you can lay it at the feet of Congress, both the Democrats and the Republicans. If you look at the House and the Senate, when they go on recess without getting anything done, you saw the stock market it's crash. That's because of the uncertainty of the House and the Senate not getting anything done. You know, Steve, my good friend here, told me about Nancy Pelosi couldn't get things done with the House when they had the majority with Democrats. Now we just saw John Boehner not getting anything done with the majority that he had, and he got slapped around. Well, the House passed. The just House recent. passed. Yeah, but the they passed it. It's the Senate where Harry Reid and the Democrats control that aren't passing anything. The House but has he passed get it passed the first time. Well, they, they had a bunch of Republicans that balked at it, and the Democrats voted against it. But the House has passed a bill that would keep the government over. It's the Democrats in the Senate to that are To pass blocking. a bill that you know the Senate will not pass is not getting it done. Is this a big deal? Is this the government's going to continue on? They'll get something eventually accomplished? Or is this, again, symptomatic of what's going on there? They just can't seem to be come together on something to make it work. Well, Steve and I both know that when you deal with the Hill on the state level or Congress at the national level, they wait till the last minute to get a deal done. Now with the Tea Party and the Democrats not working together, I think that philosophy and strategy of waiting till the last minute, unfortunately, takes us to the brink. And all of a sudden, the media gets a hold of it, the markets, both global and national. And then all of a sudden, you see the markets tanking. And I think this is not a good strategy any longer to take it to the brink. You have to look at what's actually forcing the markets down. We had another 423,000 people file new unemployment right. claims last week. Uh, Bernanke and the Fed have announced that they're going to shift their position because what they're doing is not working. You've got Italy and Greece that are a little bit further down the path to this spend money you don't have on stuff you don't need. And they're about to collapse their economies. That global impact, all these things are having an impact on us. And what we ought to be doing is looking at the problems those countries are having and how we avoid them, not copying them, which is what we're getting out of Washington. Let's talk a little bit about the president's 10-year debt reduction plan, $1.5 trillion is what he hopes to save and to cut through higher taxes on people who make over $250,000, cutting Medicaid and some other cuts that the Democrats don't like. Neither party likes, again, what the president has proposed here, although we did hear from Speaker Boehner that maybe not taxing the rich is the best idea, but maybe we need to look at the overall tax system. Is that a, a little bit of a wedge that maybe something might get done? Well, I think that Republicans have been talking for a long time about tax reform. Mm -hmm. let's, let's have an overall tax reform package that doesn't necessarily raise taxes on anybody, but puts it in a simpler way, whether that's a flat tax, whether that's a fair tax. I think there are other tax reform options that he's talking about. And keep in mind that President Obama's plan that is supposedly going to cut spending raises taxes $3 for every dollar in spending cuts. A $1.5 trillion dollar tax increase would kill the economy. And I know that because Barack Obama told us six months ago it would kill the economy. Well, it won't kill the economy because we're not raising taxes. We're bringing tax rates back to the level they were in the 90s under Bill Clinton when he was president, when we had the greatest prosperity in the history of the country. So we're not raising taxes. What we're doing is we're bringing the tax rates back to the levels that they were in the 90s when we had the greatest prosperity. So here, here this, we're going to raise taxes and then all of a sudden the country's going to go into the dumps. We went in the dumps with President Bush when he cut taxes twice and we went into the recession. So let's not go back to those failed policies of the Republicans. Let's go back to President Bill Clinton's tax levels and let's cut spending at the levels we need to in Medicare and Medicaid and let's cut spending also with Social Security and reforming it and then we can have a balanced approach raising taxes and doing some cutting. You have to have a balanced approach. Let me give Jerry just a little history lesson of the Clinton years. The first two years of the Clinton administration, we had deficits as far as the eye could see. Then Newt Gingrich and the Republicans took control midterm of the first Clinton administration. They came in, cut taxes. That's when we went to a balanced budget. That's when we went to a surplus. 
Ta cutting taxes is what produced the prosperity during the Clinton years, and it only happened when Republicans forced a cut. And I would remind you about 9-11. We just rec uh, recognized the 10th anniversary a few weeks ago. That was a trillion dollar hit to our economy. The tax cuts helped us recover out of what that gave us. Then we went back into a recession when Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid started bringing in the spending and taxing that the House and Senate brought us two years before the Bush administration ended. I, I want the audience Those to are the know, history and the had, facts. We had a surplus when Bill Clinton left. Bush took over, and then we had record deficits and recession. 9-11 kind of had an impact on that. I it think people, most people remember that, Jerry. We are 13 months roughly away from the election. Everything is political. Everything's about politics. We know that. How much of what's going on in Washington, the stalemate over the president's plan, the Republican plan, is about politics? Neither side going to give the other a victory. Well, here's what's happened. President Obama made the biggest mistake. He thought that once he was elected president, that we would stop all this bickering and, by, and this partisan bickering and that they would work with him. So he offered compromise at the beginning. And so he began negotiations in a compromised manner. He never was accepted by the Republicans to be president. They were going to say no from the time he started in 2009 till today. The Republicans have always said no. They've always said the priority is to make sure he's a one-time president. And President Obama needs to act accordingly. They're never going to work with him. They're never going to compromise with him. They're never going to pass a bipartisan bill. Again, great rhetoric, but let's look at the reality. President Obama sat down with the Republicans after he got elected and said, I won, you lost, I get to control things, I'm not going to listen to you. There was no compromise. He passed Obamanomics without any help from the Republicans, passed Obamacare, passed the Obama stimulus of a trillion dollars that hasn't worked. He had his whole agenda for two years, and the American people have rejected it. He's not listening to the American people any more than he did going into that election, and that's why the Republicans aren't compromising with him. You need to be uncompromising when the wrong principles have brought our, company to our, our country to our knees, brought companies to bankruptcy, brought individuals to, to unemployment. We need to stop doing that, and that's why the Republicans shouldn't compromise. Now, all that did not happen, Bob, in the last four years. That started under Bush in his eight years. You can't blame all of this on President Obama. But let me tell you some ray of hope. Spring Hill is about to get 1,700 jobs. You know why? Because President Obama did the right thing in saying, let's give a loan and bail out General Motors and bail out Chrysler. Because they did that, they gave General Motors an opportunity to change their business model, and now they're successful selling more cars than in the last 10 years. And guess what? Spring Hill is about to create 1,700 jobs. So despite what Steve says, President Obama's done a good job, and this is indication of that right here at home. Can we deduct the 1,000 from Solyndra that President Obama put <laughs> $500 million into that just cost $1,000 and $500 million in taxpayer money because he put money into the, into the pockets of his cronies, of his corrupt officials, and now they're trying to block the effort to find out what happened with that company and how many others are just like it. I'll acknowledge that if you acknowledge Spring Hill. Jerry, 1,700 <laughs> jobs in Spring Hill, 423,000 Americans filed new unemployment claims last week. Last I checked, 423,000 beat 1,700. When President Bush was in the office, we were losing 700,000 jobs a month. When President Obama took over, we were losing 700,000 jobs a month. When he did the stimulus package, guess what? We stopped it at zero. We stopped the bleeding. Now we're continuing to grow. It's not growing where we need to. Here's one reason. Because if Obama focuses on housing, they say you need to focus on jobs. If he focuses on jobs, they say you need to focus on housing. If he, does, if he focuses on housing and jobs, they say you need to focus on Israel and Palestine. I mean, the guy can't win because the Republicans will never work with him as the president to find solutions because they want him to fail. It's a big job if he's not up to doing all of it. He ought to quit. <laughs> were you guys surprised at all with some Senator Alexander stepping down as the third highest GOP position in the Senate right now, Senate Republican Conference Chairman, saying when he did so that maybe he is better at working at compromise for, for the Senate and getting something done. I was surprised by his statement. I was not surprised by him stepping down. Many of us have known that Lamar has not had the type of power nor support within the Senate. And so I think that there are others who wanted his position. He had to step down. Quite frankly, I think he's learned to count better. He thought he was going to be the number two position a year or so ago, and he didn't count it right, and he didn't get the position. He got the number three position. I think he was looking at a challenge. I don't think the votes were there. I think when new Republican senators come in in January, less votes will be there. I think this was a factor of vote counting, not an issue of whether or not he's going to run for re-election down the road or anything else. He may disagree with the statement, but I have always considered him more of a moderate, a centrist Republican. Because of that, can he actually have more impact outside of that office, which is a, po a political office, you have to be more of a, po you know, of a politician in that, that, that position. Bob, you, you hit it right on the head. He said, when I'm in leadership, I cannot compromise. Right. When I'm in leadership, I can't work across the aisle. Now that I'm not in leadership, I can. What does that say about the leadership of the Republican Party and the Republican senators that you cannot work towards compromise for the benefit of the country as a whole? You don't exactly see uh, Harry Reid and his lieutenants compromising. That's the problem with private party leadership, whether you're in the House or the Senate. There's not reaching across the aisle among the party leadership. I think Lamar's looking at an ability to be able to do more stuff. 
out of the party leadership because you've got to put the party first. That's true whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. I think the real issue here, though, is he is a moderate, as you point mm -hmm. out. And the Senate is more conservative, and the Republican Party is more conservative, and he wasn't going to get the votes. And I think that's that's why he's stepping down, not because moderation versus conservative. It's counting the numbers. Steve Gill, Jerry Manor, appreciate your time and your insights. Stay with us. This week continues in a moment.